Welcome to the podcast. We do recover with Jared Miller, your host. And I'm Dr. Terry Sellers, your co-host. This is a podcast about recovery from addiction. We want to talk about what successful recovery can look like. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. All right, it's time for episode 64 of We Do Recover with Jared Miller. Uh, I'm your host, Jared Miller, an advanced substance use disorder counselor. I'm Dr. Terry Sellers. Your co-host, and I am board certified in addiction medicine. And today for episode 64, we have a special guest on, Wendy Sackman. She is coming on today to talk to, talk to us about uh, an event that happened in her life where she lost her son, and she went through some tough things. I don't want to give too much of it away because that's what we're going to get into later in the episode, and how she was able to find freedom and forgiveness for forgiving those that, that were involved in uh, an, a robbery gone wrong. So before we get to all that, though... We always start these things off with something called new and good. Take it away, Doc. New and good. I'm going to go with, um, I have, uh, I don't have tons of new and goods. I never do. I just, I don't know why. Um, uh, My wife has COVID. That's that's new and bad. Hold on a minute. How do you not have any new and goods? We just had Christmas and we're on the oh, look at my precipice shirt. of New Year's. Look at my shirt. It's new and good. <laughs> That's a good point. That's an excellent it is. point. Right it is there. new and good. You're looking Thanks. slick today, Doc. Thanks. I appreciate it. You got that. a lecture at a university coming yeah, up or something? Yeah, I'm going to be doing that later. Sure. Oh, okay. Or watching the Utes. Hey, even better. I'm a Ute fan today, so that's that's new and good. Absolutely. That's definitely new. Um I was going to talk briefly. I, we don't. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I was going to talk briefly about my new and goods are going to be my New Year's resolutions. You want to hear what one of them is, and you'll Sean's going to fall out of his chair. Is Watch that this. time of the year? Let's get it. Watch this. I'm going to be on time to everything <laughs> in the new year. In 2022, <laughs> it's my resolution. Well, we'll see how long I can keep it. That sounds familiar on a previous episode, doesn't it, Sean? I'm pretty sure, like that's come that up. up. I think come it up. came up last year's New Year's. Yeah, episode. I think so. yeah. it's sounding familiar. Yeah, but so I can try again. It's popped up randomly throughout the year as well. I can try again. <laughs> you guys want me to not try? No, we definitely want you to discussions try. Discussions at five after. Hey, where's Terry? Where's Terry? Oh, there's no five after discussions. Where's <laughs> Terry? That's you're so full of it. It's unbelievable. Did you get pulled over this time? Uh, yeah. How, how many times have we heard that one? I've yes. been pulled over. I've been pulled over. You have like a Tesla that drives 100 miles an hour by itself. Yeah, and the cops Can't pull me over the, for well, that. No, no, it, did it pull you over or pull the Tesla over? No, mm. it's not a Tesla. Oh, it's a Hyundai, oh. by the way. <laughs> it just doesn't have the same impact. It does not. It still gets pulled over, though, if I'm going 100. Yeah, good point. Let's yeah. get Wendy in this mix. M- Wendy, what is new and good in your world? What's going on with you? Hey, I have been married for a year. On what? December 12th. So we're excited to, wow. s- to take some time and spend the night at the Hilton Garden Inn and Beautiful. have a little anniversary celebration tonight. So. And Wendy's Insane. still a little de-stressing because if, I, oh, if yeah. she doesn't mind me telling, <laughs> she left uh, up north. She lives in the Orem area. Is that correct? Provo? Payson. 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 Yeah. Let's, get our, let's get our facts straight, right? Payson. <laughs> and Home, the Homo weather was recovery terrible, right? We woke up to a foot of new snow. We literally had to dig out of our driveway this morning so was that the first stress test between you and your husband <laughs> your new husband <laughs> i don't know he's such a good guy but yeah he unburied all the cars this morning and then we got stuck in the road in front of our house oh we're so and glad it was you made pretty it crazy here, and then once we got to the freeway then it was just spooky but we made it <laughs> so <laughs> we'll talk about cut it close we were here what at 12 o'clock on the dot there you go a taking a page out of dog. Drive in if, the snow. if it would still be terry if it was me <laughs> if i had shown up at the time you showed up they would have said it was 12 15. So. for sure we would have <laughs> yeah what else is new and good wendy oh congratulations on the marriage yeah thank you That's awesome thank you i'm just excited to be here so we're excited you're on here great yeah excited for the new year it's always new and good when you work at steps. I just love really all of is, the right? cool things that happen there. You know, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the other thing I was going to mention is the new year is new and good. Like it, it is a. It's weird because it's in the winter where we think of, if you think of the earth uh, as a being, the winter would be the sort of death portion. Of yeah. But really, the new year gives us a chance to renew and not feel that. Like, we get to sort of pretend like it's almost spring. That was deep, Doc. 
You're welcome. That, I love that. That, <laughs> was, that was good. It was like a new You're world. welcome. Sean, Sean, what's new and good in your world? I'm disappointed in that because every time I think about the new year coming, you're like, yeah, spring is around the corner. No, it's like three months away. I got three months of we, dreariness and rain. Yeah, we, and just barely, <laughs> we just barely started winter. There's no question about like, that. This is so exciting. I get to stay in my house for another two and a half months. Like the first day of winter is December 21st. It was just last week. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, we're past but, winter solstice, so it's going to stay. We're going to stay brighter. Clinical but, note: December thirty first, noon. Sean is pessimistic. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> right. Ooh, that's, a, uh, that's an alert. <laughs> that's a never ending. I'm just so sussy. I can't diagnose. It's totally anything, worthless, dude. You got anything just new and good it. over there? Yeah, I saw mom and dad in California last week. Oh, that's fun. Um, yeah, that was about it. Everything's great. How was your weather in California? About like this. Really? Yeah, dreary. I thought we were in. I thought I drove down here. Like one of the things that appeals to me about this gig is I get to come to St. George every couple, every two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. In the winter, I thought we were in a desert. We are. How come it's been raining every time I've come down the last few times? Yeah, so. we need to stop this rain. Yeah, you know, Lake Powell, blah blah blah, drought. Yeah. Who cares? We yeah. need need more sunshine. We, we need dryness. Move to Venus. We live here for a reason, <laughs> right? Yeah. All right. Well, let's bring this. Uh, no, 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 let's, no. Yeah, no, this train's no, no, going no. off the tracks. This train We're is out of right time. on the rails. What's new and good, Jared? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, new and good with me. Yeah. So Christmas. I'm a pretty blessed guy today. Uh, my recovery has, uh, God's grace is amazing. Um, I spent my first Christmas married, remarried, with my beautiful wife, Mandy. No question. In our new home together with our little dog, Rocky. It was fantastic. And listen. I don't want to get, you know, emotional on the podcast, but I am very, very grateful for recovery. Get emotional on the podcast. Geez. That's my new and good. good I love you. it. Yeah. Good you. It looks good on you. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, it Thanks. Does. It does. And you're lucky to have Mandy as a wife. I know. I Seriously, sometimes yeah. I just watch she's, her and I'm like, she why, smiles. why is she she's married bright. to me? But I mean, I'm not complaining, right. you know? Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, it's don't, just don't a question, question for the universe. Don't question it too much. <laughs> All right. Now the train has to get, to get back on the rails. All right, here I feel we go. Better about it now. Okay, so Wendy Sackman is on here to join us today. Part one's brought to you by. Part one is brought to you by Steps Recovery Centers. We're, they are ready to help when you're ready for them to help you. We have a new tagline. I had to switch it up. Oh. Ah. If you're ready for help, reach out to them at 801-800-8142. Again, that's Steps Recovery Centers. They are ready to help when you're ready for them to help you. Reach out by giving them a call at 801-800-8142. Wendy's got a little experience with Steps. Wendy, I thank you for joining us today. There's nobody oh, here so today welcome. that hasn't worked at Steps. That is pretty fantastic. That's true. Yeah. Well, I know I still get some of his mail, Terry's mail. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> I does not. No. <laughs> Return to sender. There well, you go. Uh, I, I could tell a story about that, but I won't <laughs> on the air. Okay. So, Wendy, we've kind of had the little intro, the promo that we have for this. Uh, it, let's just get into it. Talk to me about Jeff. Okay, my son Jeff, and I, I brought a little picture of him when he was ki a kid. I hope you can see this. Just yeah. because, you know, as parents, when we have our children, the most we want for these kids is to have a good life, to grow up healthy and happy and not have a lot of bad experiences. Yeah. And um, as a mother, when Jeff started getting into his addictions, he was probably 12 or 13. And we went through all of the fun stuff, you know, drug court and, <laughs> and all that fun things that leads to that. And then he started um, doing roofs, and he fell off a roof. Mm. He Ooh. was, you know, roofing. And anyway, he That's injured his start. back. That's the start And of the story. doctor put him on OxyContin, and that, that was his start, where he started getting worse and worse into the drug addiction, where he was stealing. And me, as a mom... And I'll be the first to say I'm very codependent because I always thought I could love him better. Mm. I could bail him out or pay off his car title loan and, and everything would be okay. And he would, you know, that this would fix it. I couldn't understand why he couldn't just quit. I didn't yeah. understand that. I didn't, with all the best intentions, right? With all the best intentions, yeah. I would try to help him through that and, and just love him like a mother loved him. And probably believed a lot of his stories sure, <laughs> and, sure. and um, was manipulated a lot. I've learned a lot since I've started working for Steps. But um, anyway, I finally all came to a head when he forged a bunch of checks of ours. I used to sell real estate, and I had got the biggest commission of my life. 
And um, I was so excited. I got online, and I was checking the balance, and all I could see was negative, negative, negative. And I started bawling. I clicked on one of the checks, and it was forged. And I thought, I'm done. I am so done (laughs) with being stolen from. And so I pressed charges on four of those checks, which gave him four felonies. Whoa. And therefore he... um, That's the opposite of codependence, though. I know. Shout out to my mom. I'm sorry. I was guilty of that, too. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, he did. He went to jail. He was there for six months, and in jail he got sober. His curls grew out. His smile came back. I saw the light in his eyes, and he was so excited. He had a new leash on life. Yeah. You know, and when he got out, he was motivated. His elder brother is a master electrician. He got him as an an apprentice job. He got him books. He was going to go to school to be an electrician like his brother. He was very talented in in um handyman type stuff he could wire things and he didn't had never been taught but he could always figure things like that out and so he started a new job we had him enrolled in school and three days into the job his background check came in Mm. and the foreman came up to jeff and said where's this jeff jensen he said i don't want any worthless da 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 like you working on my job site that's too bad fired him and it was like the light went out of him. Yeah. And watching him go through this was heart wrenching because I thought I did this to him, so there's my codependency again. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, I can remember him laying on his bed, and he just says, "Why doesn't things work out for me? Why does everything go so wrong in my life?" You know. So it was definitely devastating. Oh, devastating! For him. And he started to spiral down again. Started using again. Um, it was just really hard watching that. In fact, a few times he tried to get sober on his own, and he would go into his room, close the door for two or three days. And I, I mean, one day he was in there for three or four days, and I hadn't heard a word. I'd been knocking on the door. He had never answered, and I thought, what is going on? Is he dead in there? I need to check. No answer. Door's locked. Well, I had a little bit of martial arts experience, so... <laughs> The mom I am, I kicked the door down (laughs) (laughs) to see if he was okay. And he's laying on his bed, and he looks at me, and he goes, geez, mom. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, um, yeah, that's kind of the start. And do you want me to go into what happened to him? or? Well, that's kind of where it all started. Let's definitely get into that, though. First and foremost, uh, what do you think, Doc? What do I think? We got we got a whole bunch of, I mean, what I've heard so far is we have a whole bunch of people in this story. There's a doctor, there's a mom, there's a son, there's a brother, there's a boss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All doing things th- that they felt were right. Now, calling somebody a worthless fill in the blank, blank. Yeah. right, isn't... Um, it, it, it isn't doing your best, but um, but all people thinking at least they were doing their best. Like mom's doing her best, son's doing his best. The doctor might have uh, might have felt like OxyContin was the drug for him because he broke his back after falling off a roof. I mean, these things are all that you, and around you, the time you're hearing it's less than one percent addictive, right? Right. That was you a big you, claim to you can you can see where these all led, but you can also see where these guys were well and everybody in that story so far has been well intentioned, except for maybe the boss who whatever. I mean <laughs> the boss was protecting his job maybe. I don't know. Where does it go from there, Wendy? So um it goes on the week of Thanksgiving, 2012, we were doing our holiday activities, and we had all the family together. We got a great, big, wonderful family picture, which I'm grateful for. And then, um, and then the day after Thanksgiving is Black Friday, and everyone's out Black oh Friday yeah. shopping. Jeff's out with his friends, and he's telling his friends, he's going, "Geez, I got these two people bugging me. I need to go meet them because he said they won't leave me alone." Well. Two weeks earlier, these two individuals put a plan together to rob Jeff to get money for a wedding ring. Mm -hmm. And they had told it. So there are two individuals, Stephen Sutton and Shalisa Nielsen. And Stephen told his sister. 
And he says, we're going to rob Jeff. We're going to get some money to buy a wedding ring. And she says, well, that's not a good idea. He knows where you live. And yeah. he says, well, we're not going to leave any witnesses. So they texting Jeff all day long. He finally agrees to meet them. And they're asking him if he has any Roxy's at that time, which he did. So they knew that he was being prescribed pain medication. Yeah. Okay. And so he went, well, and he had other sources, I'm sure, by this time. Yeah. You know. Goes with the territory. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And um, so he met them at the bowling alley in Payson. Well, they decided it was too busy, too many people, so they moved their meeting to the abandoned Flying J off the Payson exit. Mm. And Jeff um, shows up there, walks to their truck, and is standing next to their truck, and Stephen says, Jeff, you know, you got the pills? He hands him the pills, and he says, now I want your money. And Jeff says, I don't have any money, man. And he's going, yes, you do. I want your money. Give me the effing money, you know. And mm -hmm. Jeff's going, I don't have any money. And Stephen, or Shalisa, at this time we didn't know, but I heard Shalisa was saying, pulled, you know, shoot him. They shot him point blank, standing there by the truck, the door of the truck, in the chest. and um, With a shotgun. With a shotgun. Ooh. Wow. And Jeff... Um, I later learned, I, I picked, you know, as a mother, when you hear this, you just want to know that they just died instantly, didn't suffer. But I later learned sure. in court that he stumbled back 10 feet before he fell. And Stephen got out of the truck and went up to Jeff and got his wallet, his cell phone, and $50 cash. That's all he had on him. $50 cash. Yeah, that's tragic. Left him there and... Um, went back to his truck, and he and Shalisa were talking, and they decided that they needed to wash the truck because blow back from a shotgun, you know what happens there. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that there was, yeah. Yeah, and um, and so they got in their truck and started driving up Pace and Main Street. They took a ride at the light to go to the car wash, and they were following another car too closely with their brights on, and an officer passed coming in the other direction and thought it was road rage. So he turned around, turned on his lights. <coughs> Stephen turned left and threw the shotgun out the window and um, and then pulled over at the top of the hill. Shalisa was ducking in the truck so the officer didn't see him. He saw Stephen open the door to get out, so he got out of his car, the squad car, and then Stephen took off running. So the officer's chasing Stephen, yelling in his mind, you know, calling, officer needs up. assistance, yeah, yeah, foot pursuit, officer needs assistance. And, and Stephen runs to the Walker Mortuary in Payson, and there's foliage behind it that kind of goes on a hill. Well, he starts climbing the foliage, and Officer Bastion, here's two other officers at the top. So he goes around, and they all have him cornered, and the officer's saying, get down, get down. And Stephen's going, just shoot me, man. And they're going, get down. Why are you running? Yeah, it's a traffic this stop. is just a traffic stop. Yeah. 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 And, and your Stephen's on going your phone too closely. Yeah, and Stephen's going. Well, I don't have any insurance. Just shoot me, man. And they finally had to tase him to get him to lay down, to mm. get him down. So they take him back to their truck, his truck, and they're looking at him. They're going, "Why do you have blood all over you? Why is there blood all over your truck?" And Stephen says, "Well, I hit a deer and I had to gut it." And then they hear a call on the radio and um, that there's a body at the Flying J. <coughs> and so they're starting to put things together. Well, Stephen heard the radio sure. and bolted. They had called the EMTs in to pull the, pl the taser plugs. Mm -hmm. And Stephen bolted through the EMTs to get away and run. And one of the EMTs tackled him within a few feet. And so then they put him in the squad car. And it was a brand new squad car. They didn't... Um, lock it correctly i guess there's some kind of a way that you lock a police car so never been in there yeah, yeah. mistake <laughs> made yeah and so he escaped again wow and this time there's a two-hour manhunt in payson looking for stephen sutton and um they finally find him with dogs hiding under a um suv so then they have him in custody, and this time they were not letting him go in the meantime shalisa had got out of the truck well they lived a block from where they were pulled over. So she went home and took a shower, called Stephen's mom to come and get her. She was able to just get a, get away after ducking yeah, down. Yeah, because Stephen drew, drew the officer away. Wow. And so she, she called Stephen's mom and said, come and get me, I'm really scared. Stephen's in a lot of trouble. There's cops everywhere. So she came to Payson from Salem to pick up Shalisa and um, saw her just walking by the at the park with a couple of friends with a hoodie over her head, but she noticed her hair was wet and stuff, and... 
Shalisa told her everything. So when they got to his mom's house, she called the cops and they came and got Shalisa. So, but um, that night, about quarter to nine, I had texted Jeff. You know, he lived at home. I says, "When are you going to be home?" And he says, "IDK why?" And I'm going, "IDK oh, I don't know." <laughs> right, right. Anyway, so um, this ha- this is prior to this. This incident is happening. prior yeah. to it, and um. That was my last conversation with my son, a little text message, Mm. because he was killed at 9 o'clock. So I went to bed that night, and about 2.45 in the morning, and I'll say this. What is a mother's worst nightmare if you have a a son or daughter or someone you love in addiction? That that they're going to, you're going to get that call, that call, or not get a call. And yeah. not know. And well, not know. Well, right. you're going to get that call eventually, whether it's from, I mean, that's the True. greatest fear is they're going to be dead. Yeah. It is. And you sleep better knowing they're safe in their bed right. at night. Right. Yeah. Well, I got the knock on the door. Ooh. And so I got the up, went to the door. The knock on the door is actually worse than the call, probably. Yeah. yeah. I went to the door and I opened it. I was in my nightgown. I thought Jeff had got locked out. Sure. And I see you just two, thought he was home officers. and just locked out. Yeah. Yeah. I saw two officers standing there. Oh. And I said, um, oh, just a sec, let me grab a robe. I recognize one of them, Officer Bill Wright. He's the place, was the patient chief of police at the time. I didn't know the other person. But anyway, I grabbed my robe and then went back to the door. And I said, has Jeff been in an accident? And they said, no. And I says, well, um, has he been in a, you know, is he in jail? Yeah. <laughs> and, and they said, no. And I says, well, it must not be good if you're here. And they, as they come into the house, they said, your son's been involved in a homicide. And I'm trying to wrap my head around homicide. I knew yeah. it wasn't good. And yeah. I says, well, is he okay? Yeah. And they said, no, your son is dead. I sat on the couch and I just kept saying, my son is dead. My son is dead. Mm. I expected him to walk through the door any minute and have everything be okay. You know, I just, I thought this can't be real. This just doesn't happen. How? You know, and um, I could hear my husband outside um, crying on the deck. And the officers just stood there and kind of gave us some time to regroup as best as we could. And then they um, said, we want you to be prepared for some things. You know, the media is going to try to contact you. Your son's body lied at the, you know, was laying next to his car with the car running until 2 a.m., and we From just nine w- o'clock at night. Yeah, while they did the investigation. Okay. And they just wanted us to kind of be prepared for some of the things that we were going to hear. And they said we will keep you posted on the investigation. And they kind of left us with that. And and oh, so after they left, we called our family. And um, I had my parents there, and my brother and sister in law came. And I was sitting on the couch. We were kind of waiting for some kind of news. And I'm sitting next to my sister in law, and on comes. Fox 13, and the first thing I saw was this white truck on the news with blood splattered all over the side of it. So they didn't wash it off very well, or they was that your son's it. truck? No, no it was yeah, Stephen's truck. Oh, they didn't make it to the they car wash. They didn't make it to the okay. car wash, and I saw the blood splattered oh, wow. all over the side of the truck, and I'm looking at this going, is that my son's blood? And lost it. (laughs) And I was, after that, I was so angry with the news for being so insensitive, knowing that the family was going to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and then came the news stories, you know, drug dealer shot in pace and man killed at the Flying J and drug deal gone wrong and all this. And so I'm going through all these weird emotions. I'm embarrassed. I'm mourning. I'm just... All this stuff, it's like, oh my angry. heck, you know, angry. Just, I didn't know how to feel. It was really hard. And then I read something, you know, the Daily Herald posts a pic, a story, and I see three drug, three druggies shot, or three druggies off the street and one shot, and we didn't even have to pay for the bullet. Ooh. And I'm just going, this is not right. Yeah. You know, and um, wow. And so I started emailing the news stations and saying. Guys, here's a picture. His name isn't Jeffrey Byrne. It's Jeffrey Vern Jensen. He was my son. He doesn't deserve to have this be the last words about him all over the news, you know. Please say something good about him. He didn't ask to be shot in cold blood standing by a truck. Right. These were his friends. I'd seen him at our house, you know. 
Anyway, um, and so I finally consented to talk to Channel 4 News, and they come to my home, and I did an interview, and... We're about we're oh, getting close. We're yeah. going to take and a break it, in 20 got seconds. The story, so. <laughs> got the story across that well, he was a, a beloved son and uncle. So. Beautiful. We'll pick, we'll pick that up in a second segment. Yeah. For we sure. definitely <laughs> want to come back and pick that up. That... <laughs> Let's so all take a deep breath first, though. That was that was uh, heavy. Join us in, in uh, episode 64, part two, where Wendy talks about a little bit more about that news as well as how she found forgiveness through this whole thing right after this 30-second break from our sponsor. You are listening to We Do Recover with Jared Miller and co-hosted by Dr. Terry Sellers. We'll be right back after this short break with more of We Do Recover with Jared Miller, sponsored by Steps Recovery Center and the Hilton Garden Inn. Hi everybody, I'm Shalee. I'm one of the clinical directors at STEPS Recovery Center. At STEPS, we really want to focus on the individual and not just the person in addiction. We want to have the ability to help from the time you enter and tell the time you finish, whether you need healing from trauma or family issues and concerns. We got you covered from the start of your journey to the end of your journey. We're just here to help when you're ready for us to help you. We welcome you back to We Do Recover with Jared Miller, co-hosted by Dr. Terry Sellers. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. And now with part two of our podcast, Jared Miller and Dr. Terry Sellers. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are involved in a, man, this is a heavy-duty story, and we went right up to the break, and we were so involved in it that we kind of went right up to it, but... We're going to get back to that in just a second. First, the second part of the today's <laughs> podcast is sponsored by the Hilton Garden Inn. If you or a loved one are passing through Southern Utah, give them a Google search because they'll take really good care of you. The Hilton Garden Inn has amazing amenities. The staff is super friendly. The rooms are great. You know me. I always mention the pool because I think it's such a cool, it's a nice pool. Um, but they're really good to us, and so give them a shot and let them have some of your business because they'll treat you really well. We're also sponsored by... I was going to say, you know, one thing that Wendy's talking about right before the break was that stigma piece, right? The news, they're, they're basically putting on blast, and that's all stigma-based stuff. They, they didn't tell the story about Jeff. They told the story about heavy-based stigma stuff. Well, Recovery Strong is all about... Fighting addiction, strengthening recovery, and reversing the stigma around addiction. They're an apparel company. I got my mug right here. Recovery strong. They got flags. They got t-shirts. They got hoodies. If you're interested in wearing your recovery out loud and changing the stigma around addiction, go to recoverystrong.com. Click on gear. Buy yourself some apparel. We love those guys. Thank you, Recovery Strong. It's beautiful. Okay. Well, here we are. We are. Uh, let, let's get right back to where we were. We'll start from there. Um, we kind of rushed you into what the news said about him, but l- why don't you just go with that? Like, so finally you agree to talk to Channel 4 News, you said? Mm-hmm. Okay, so what happens after you talk to them? Yeah, so they come to my home, and I did an interview, which I cried through most of it. But yeah. um, wow. anyway, when I watched that how segment. How long after the death was the interview? Two days. Oh, so That's super so raw. Fresh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh. Yeah, Saturday. I Jeff was killed Friday night. Saturday, I spent most of the day just kind of regrouping and then getting angry at the ra- the media, and emailing the media. And then they called me and said, "Could we come to your home?" And I, I decided that would probably be a good thing, you know. And Wendy, we're coming up on ten years, and I got to tell yeah. you, there's parts there that I could, even if I had something to say, I wouldn't have been able to talk because I had a I had a lump in my throat. Mm-hmm. And and I'm super impressed that you can tell you've done some work around it because I wouldn't be able to tell that story. I don't think without being a sobbing mess. So Thank you're a you. strong woman. Okay, Thank so you. where do we go from there? So yeah, um, the the person that came to my home, you know, did the interview. It was, it's mostly a cameraman and then they take it and they edit it and clip it and put it all back together. (laughs) And, and, um, uh, the story turned out beautiful. It was just exactly what we were hoping for. And so, um, we drove to the flying J now at this time, I didn't think I could go past the flying J knowing that this was where my son passed away and the media was still there. And I was able to give Lauren, the lady that did the story, a hug and thank her for so doing such a beautiful job. So that was really great. And yeah, and then, you know, it's the weekend. I know there's so many 
people who have lost loved ones in addiction, and they can relate to walking around in a fog yeah, and, t- and trying to plan the services. And I was able to go with my two daughters to the funeral home and dress my son. Mm. And that was my last service to him as his mother. Yeah. <laughs> so I was really grateful I was able to do that. He looked, you know, um, we had seen him earlier in the week when we went to the funeral home. We were planning the thing, the funeral. We had not seen him. We didn't know where he was or what was going on. We knew it was all just an investigation. They had him in a place, but the director said he's right there in the next room, and there was a curtain between us, and so we were able to see him. And I just remember thinking he looked at peace, you know. And I, um, I find it fascinating that, that I can tell that meant a lot to you to be able to provide that service. Mm-hmm. to him you know it reminds me of, of i don't mean to get biblical but kind of jesus when he washed his disciples feet you know it's a sign of respect and yeah. love and that's amazing thank you yeah it was really cool so um anyway we got through a beautiful service and um another thing jeff always felt like everybody hated him he thought he was worthless he didn't mm-hmm. think he had any friends but a bunch of his friends put together a candlelight vigil at the flying J. um a couple nights before the service. And there were probably 150 people there all holding a candle. And it was beautiful. And and different people take turns getting up and saying, you know, he helped me here. He helped me fix my car. He gave me a ride. And, and I was just hoping that he saw that. Because, you know, addiction does wear you down. You do feel like nobody cares or loves you. It, it strikes me that that's such a common theme in uh, in addiction is people feel like a- a- and frankly it's not even just addiction like mental health sometimes mm-hmm. people feel like that they're outcasts or that nobody they don't fit in or that you know they don't have very many friends and it's only <coughs> sometimes it's only in death that others are able to figure out how much their son was loved or how much their daughter was respected or their loved one was and uh, uh, if we can take something home from this podcast today, let's take home that let's not wait until our loved ones are. D- and I don't. I'm not saying you did this. I don't think you did this at all. But some of his friends might have. Let's not wait until our loved ones are dead to let them know how much we appreciate and love them. Because yeah, that, in death, it's a little bit mm-hmm. too late. But yeah. man, we got to make we got we got to do a better job in this world of making people feel loved and know that we love them. For sure. We got to do that with our friends. We got to do that with our family. We got to do that with everybody in our lives because you just never know. Right? It's so yeah. true. So true. Especially like, I'm sure Jeff, how old was Jeff when this happened? 28. 28. So I, I'm, I, yeah. I'm That's sure you tw- thought you had plenty of time left with him. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. A- a- and the other thing, though, is if I look at his friends, as 28-year-olds, we're not wandering around telling each other we love each other. Of course very not. Much. Yeah. We're just not. We're just too caught up in the 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 stuff of the Busyness. world the glitz yeah. and the glamour and the macho-ness and the well you know whatever it is we're caught up in that stuff and expressing our love to people isn't very important at the age of 28 and and it needs to be yeah i think sure. so wendy thank you for be- painting that beautiful picture bring us into there they were both arrested they were both arrested okay and because we had two defendants and um, there were two sets of attorneys which drug the court process out for over oh. two years. Oh. Two years. Oh, this two is years. And right. so um, going to the courthouse, you know, to see something happen, and it seemed like two or three times every month, and then we'd get a stay, and the attorneys did something wrong, and it just kept getting drug out. But I remember sitting there in the courtroom and seeing them walk into the courtroom in their their gel clothes and handcuffed and so forth and looking at them and just feeling like I was being stabbed in the heart. Mm -hmm. I thought, how could you look at Jeff standing there scared and pull the trigger? How could you even plan to do this? And so all these thoughts and feelings and anger and hurt and pain in my heart. And all I could think of is I cannot carry this for the rest of my life. So I started praying night after night for Stephen and Shalisa by name. Please, God, take this pain from my heart. Please help me to forgive them. Night after night. And 
after, you know, when we got, we went to trial, but it wasn't without a jury. But I listened to four days of um, testimonies, pictures, and everything to the detail of the blood dripping off the ceiling of the truck, splattered on the window of the truck. There was forensic for the exterior, forensics for the interior. There was blood on the floor, the steering wheel. And, um, and then, you know, Jeff stumbled back 10 feet before he fell. A lot of this, and boy, did it hammer my heart. <laughs> uh, sure by enough. Saturday, by the time we got done, I felt like I was just done you know but um i was also starting to have a change of heart i was starting to see stephen and shalisa a little differently and starting to feel sorry for them and when we finally got you know neither one of them would say what had happened it was a 44 inch barrel and so they couldn't determine whether shalisa pulled the trigger because jeff was standing right next to the truck or stephen and they were both pointing the finger of blame at each other. And so that's what drug this out so long. I loved listening to Doug Finch, the county attorney. He's amazing. He did such a great job. And um, anyway, finally, you know, we, would, we finally started giving him pleas, and they were still turning it down. And then finally Stephen said, I'm the one that pulled the trigger. You know, and, um, and so we went to sentencing. And at sentencing... I was starting to actually feel like I loved them and was worried about where they were going to be. What an amazing gift because I felt like my heart was healed and we made it to this point and now I was worrying about them. I knew my son was safe. I'd done we did his temple work. We'd I'd felt him holding me. I knew he was in a better place, but now what did these two have ahead of them? You know they they were going to spend Stephen got 25 years, Steve, Shalisa got 15, and they were going to spend their, their prime life in jail and or prison. And anyway, um, <clears throat> then Stephen got up, and I have that with me today. If I have a second, I'll read this letter. This is a letter that Stephen wrote to our family and um, read it to us in court. And this is him after he's been in jail for two years, mm. how he's feeling. And I'll just read this real quick, if I may. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, this letter is meant for the Jensen family, anyone who knew or loved Jeff, and everyone that was affected by the choices I made on this day this devastating tragedy occurred. A precious life was lost. I'm so truly and deeply sorry for that. I know and realize that all the apologies in the world will not change what happened that day. Or will it bring back his life? Though I wish it could. If I could trade my life for his, I swear to God I would. Unfortunately, that is just not possible. In a very real way, a very somber way, a large part of me was lost that day, and my life changed as well. Not just the fact that I've been removed from society, but more so because <coughs> my days are plagued with anxiety and depression, and my nights much the same, filled with vivid nightmares that cause me to awaken frantically and in tears. I live with so much remorse that the gnawing distress I feel from the sense of guilt I have, make even the deepest pits of hell feel welcoming and inviting. On the day this tragedy occurred, I was heavily under the influence of drugs. I have been an addict for most of my life, and that being said, I have, not been, I have now been clean from all drugs for over two years, and I can now see the destruction and havoc that my drug use has caused. In, addic in addition to this tragedy, I've hurt my own family and also damaged the community in ways I can't even believe, imagine. Now being in recovery, I'd like to devote my efforts to addicts that sti are still struggling with this disease. It's one way I can be of service to others, and if it's all right with the Jensen family, I'd like to de dedicate this act of service in Jeff's name. Therefore, all the positive things that arise from this service will bring honor to him also. I'm sincerely sorry for the pain that I have caused. I pray to God that one day you will find it in your hearts to forgive me. May God have mercy on my soul. Please, God, bless these families, and I pray to God that Jeff may rest in peace. Sincerest regrets, Stephen. Wendy, thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. In the last, you know, 10 or so minutes we have here, I got to know, did you get that letter? First of all, it sounds like this was a never-ending nightmare for a long time. For a long time. 
at what point did you get that? Was the, the letter that started to change your heart or can you pinpoint kind of when it started to move away from that denial and anger into more of acceptance and forgiveness? When did that happen? Um, I think about a year and a half of praying for them. I started, you know, I'd see them come in the courtroom and then I started feeling sorry for them. So um, let me do this in my own brain. So a year and a half of praying, you started praying for them early in the trial? Um, I started, yeah, you know what? Somewhat into the trial. After, after everything had kind of settled and we started going to court and I kept thinking, how can I get rid of this pain? Because I was seeing them come in. Yeah. It hurt so bad, yeah. you know? And so I, pro I probably was praying for them for about a year before I started feeling that peace. Okay, but was the trial going on that whole year, I guess? Is it wasn't really a trial. It was just like stays, you know I mean? We would go in and they'd say, well, we're going to have to postpone. We're going to have yeah. to postpone. Yeah. Nothing I'm going to call that, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but yeah. I'm going to call that whole thing a trial, like that yeah. that whole part of the court the system. Court yeah, When it legal. starts in the courts and then when it ends. Mm -hmm. um, so... It was did you so did you feel that peace before they were given their sentence then or yes okay yeah oh right. yeah when he read that letter it was just so powerful yeah for sure I I want to keep going on this vein but mm -hmm. Jared started alluding to something that I want Jared to enlighten us on and that is um, just for those listening there are defined stages of grief that you have talked about today. That and there's typically five or six, depending on who you listen to. But, um, but uh, will you educate us on those? The, the what the different stages of grief are? Yeah, absolutely. So, so using Wendy's example of, of grief and loss, typically there's five stages of change. The first one, and they, they don't they don't have to go linear, St right? Like it doesn't of grief. You said stage of change. There oh, are stages there are of five, change. There are five stages of change also. But <laughs> I need yeah. somebody to keep me on track here. So five stages of grief. The first one typically is denial, right? Not believing it, not right. accepting it. There's no way when the cops knock on your door and tell you your son's dead, you, you just, that's Had to have felt like a dream. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that safe to say? Yes, yes. So the next one's going to be anger, mm -hmm. which sounds like you experienced that one. I did. Uh, especially the first part of, of everything that was going on. Anger towards the media, anger towards the individuals that were responsible. Absolutely. Bargaining typically is the third stage, you know, oh, you know, it typically sounds like God, take this away. I'll do X, Y, and Z. If, if you can undo this, uh, different forms of bargaining, uh, depression is going to be number four. And then number five is acceptance with that said. So those are the five again, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, uh, and acceptance. They don't typically go in order though. I mm -hmm. can go one day from feeling depressed to, Back to anger. denial, Easy. right, anger, I think I've had acceptance around it, so they're all over the place. Right, right, yeah. thanks. Those yeah. are, that's important, I think, for people to re recognize that there's, there are these stages, and they, they, they do sort of come in some sort of order, but you're right, they bounce back and forth all the time. Like, just because you've supposedly graduated to anger or bargaining doesn't mean you can't go back to denial. Right, right. Those things do bounce around. Was there any of that for you, Wendy? Did you find yourself kind of back jumping around in any of those five? Can you see yourself in each one of those five stages? I can see myself in, in the five stages, but I don't remember really bouncing back and forth. It just seemed like a process. You know? It's okay. a process. That's healing. That's exactly what it is. Good. That's exactly yeah, right. So it's a natural process. Like these are stages that happen whether you do something or not. Like these are the stages of grief. They happen to virtually everybody. And for some people, like a stage can be a day or, or, right. or 10 minutes, but they tend to happen to most people that, that have a loss like, like you've had. So, so Wendy, bring us, th bring this thing full circle. So what ended up happening through the court systems? Uh, it sounds like the forgiveness was a big part of your healing. Talk to us about what that looks like. Here we are 10 years later. What's life like around this for you? How has this affected your life and what you do today? Well, you know, Jeff was killed in 2012. Mm -hmm. In 2013, um, I felt like I needed to change. And um, and I, I wanted to find full-time work. And so I got online. I saw Steps Recoveries looking for a receptionist. And, um, and I thought, oh, you know, it would be cool to be able to help or serve people 
in this industry, you know, yeah. that have been through what I went through with my son. And so um, I updated my resume, I sent an email, and in that email I said, even if you have found someone for this position, I would be happy to share my son's story. If I could help someone else in some way, it would help heal this mother's broken heart. Yeah. And I hit send, and my phone rang in two minutes. It was <laughs> Mike Jorgensen, who I love. And he says, Wendy, when can we talk? You know, and and he, I, um, I had, being in real estate, I worked at Bill Brown Realty, and we had a school, and Bill had, or Mike had actually came through there, and I was the one that made him watch all the videos and take the tests because he was trying <laughs> to get his real estate license. And so he knew me and recognized me when I sent that resume, and he hired me that day. That's and amazing. So, and, um, and I was thinking, oh, my goodness, what have I done? Full-time work now. You know, I've been kind of doing my thing, bookkeeping. I was hauling horses. <laughs> and and um, anyway, and the next morning I'm saying my prayers, and I clearly heard my son's voice. And I, and I just felt like, okay, this is where I'm meant to be. And now I have shared this story, of, you know, this, this story with many, many people. And I feel like in some way it's touching them and it's helping and I'm doing honor to Jeff by doing that and also helping me to heal. And thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing it with our listeners. There'll yeah. be a few thousand people that, yep, that a few download more this episode. <laughs> a few Absolutely. more thousand that heard your story. <laughs> so so what ended up happening with the court systems with the two people that happened? Did you were there any uh I guess looking back, anything that you wish would have went differently? What was the outcome with that? No, um, everything went well. They, you know, they, Stephen finally said, I'm the one that pulled the trigger. Then they went to sentencing. And like I said, he got 25 years and she got um, 15. And he was, they were both sent to the point. But because Stephen is smaller, and this was another thing I was worrying about. It's crazy, but he's smaller. And they were saying he's going to be somebody's whatever. Yeah. And, um, somebody's friend. Yeah, friend. And I, yeah. <laughs> and so they actually moved into Salina. So he's in Salina now. You know, and that's, I feel, I'm feeling the prompting. I feel like this is my next step. I really would like to go visit him. Yeah, I was, that was going to be my next question yeah. is, is, has he written you letters? Has he the contact hasn't, continued? But I just, you know, I was able to read a letter in the courtroom and look him in the eye and tell him I had forgiven him. I bet that was powerful for you. It was pretty you. cool. That's yeah. good for you. Yeah. That's, that's, if it did nothing for him, that's fine. No, he, but it did he a lot I for remember you. the well, look on his face. I'll never forget it. He just kind of looked shocked. Well, it did a lot for you him. Know? There's no there's no question it probably did, but yeah. we don't have the, him on here to ask the him. The benefit that. was yeah. no. the benefit for sure. Like this is why we forgive people is because it helps us. Mm -hmm. That concept is hard for people to understand though. Like as a counselor, when I work with people and typically when we're doing a, a step five where they're processing their, you know, resentments and things like that. Typically, one of the last questions I ask is, what is it going to take for you to let that resentment go? Yep. What is it going to take for you to move past that? Where do you have amends you need to make in that? And and people look at you like you're what was crazy. You? I right. have to forgive somebody who's done or terrible things to me? Or no, you don't. You can carry it around for the rest of your life and let it define your life. Mm -hmm. And keep you right? stuck. That's what I'm saying. Right? Exactly. Right? Yeah. So the forgiveness isn't isn't necessarily to help other people feel good. It's to release the burden from you. And that's the thing I love about this episode. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, call me crazy. You're crazy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I would have the power to be able to forgive like Wendy has. Oh, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a good point. That takes a lot. Yeah, it takes I a lot. I think that has helped her more than she even realizes, although I'm sure she realizes some of it. But you're right. I mean, that stuff is so important for our own growth and our own ability to live the rest of our lives in peace. So, Wendy, with a, a couple minutes left here, what messages would you have or what message would you have for families who are struggling with somebody who's who's in active addiction, maybe early recovery? I mean, you, you've gone through this thing firsthand as a mom. Mm -hmm. Talk to our listeners out there that are the family members. You know, I've thought about that a lot. What could I have done differently? And, um, you know, I think standing strong, actually putting him in jail was my first step mm -hmm. to, you know, helping him. Nope. Because he, it did, even though after he got out and things changed again, but started standing up, you know, saying, I'm done with this treatment. I'm done with the lies. I'm done with the manipulation. And, and um, 
So I hear boundaries. To Stop enabling him. Yeah, yeah I that was I was a huge enabler. So it, it just stands strong, guys. Except to give you some credit. <laughs> yeah. Many people never get to those boundaries. Many people never. Many people would never call the cops on their son if they wrote if they uh, falsified checks. Well, and he stole my car and took off. He was That's threatening he was going to kill himself after I did that. So it was pretty ugly. <laughs> no question. That took so a lot of courage, and that is definitely not. So you've been hard on yourself for your for your own codependence. Mm -hmm. But the truth is you had great moments of where you weren't that way. And so, yeah, I think that that's critical. I think that if, if parents can get to that, because listen, uh, we're almost out of time, but I, I, I do a lot of preaching <laughs> because... Uh, but I also have had some experience with children and substances, and I'm really good at telling people what to do, but I'm really crappy at doing it myself. It's always harder. Right. Mm -hmm. It's easier to give somebody else the advice. I Absolutely. know exactly what to tell people to do when their son's using drugs, but, man, I have a hard time doing it myself. Yeah, absolutely. I think, too, it's, it's important to the advice I would give family members is get them on an insurance plan, okay? Mm -hmm. And then hire an interventionist. You don't always have to take what feels like the most extreme route possible. Uh, but re unless you're educated on it, you don't know what you don't know. And so I never judge or blame people, but there is that. Wendy, thank you so much for coming on here. I really appreciate you weathering the storm. <laughs> She's fantastic, right? So yeah. this has been a fun episode. It's thank been a hard episode. episode. It was a great episode. Thank you yeah. for having me. You are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you, lady. Love you. All right, guys. So join us next week for episode 65. It'll be Friday at 4 o'clock like always. Stay safe out there. Have a great New Year's. Thank you for joining us today on We Do Recover with Jared Miller. Help us spread our message of hope. Like, comment, and share. If you have any topics or ideas for future shows, please share that on our Facebook page. That Facebook page is We Do Recover with Jared Miller. If you or a loved one needs help, please reach out to us. Again, thank you for listening. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. This has been a production from a podcast studio.